testimony in the murder trial of Lori Vallow Daybell continues in Idaho. She's accused of killing her children, Tylee and JJ, and of conspiring to kill her husband's first wife, Tammy Daybell. On the stand today was the husband of Melanie Gibb. You may remember Melanie. She took the stand a little earlier. She's the former friend of Lori Vallow Daybell, who testified last week about what Lori told her about her visions and how she and Chad Daybell were supposed to be together. The defense tried to keep Melanie's husband from testifying because he watched some of her testimony. But after questioning him, the judge ruled that he could take the stand and testify. Among the things he testified about were the last time he saw JJ. Here with our debrief is Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter. Chanley, great to see you. You're joining us from, of course, the courthouse in Boise, Idaho. Um, tell us what's the latest from the testimony. What did we hear in the last hour or so? Great to be with you, Michael and Ashley. So right now the court is in its mid-afternoon break after hearing from a couple of detectives from the Rexburg Police Department. Uh, right before the break, the jury actually saw some body cam video of Lori Vallow Daybell during the welfare check back, back in November 2019 that Kay Woodcock called wondering about the whereabouts of her grandson, J.J. Vallow. So remember in the preliminary hearing against Chad Daybell, we heard the audio of this body cam, but today I was in there and I actually witnessed the body cam. Lori Vallow's on the screen in front of the jury from that date wearing a black sweatshirt and she is telling the officers that JJ is with her friend Melanie in Arizona and she is blaming everything on Kay Woodcock coming after her trying to sue her. She also says that her one of her brothers we presume it's Adam is trying to kill her for her two million dollar life insurance policy. She is very chatty in this body cam video and of course we know based on the testimony of the detective, they were already suspicious of Lori Vallow because they had been surveilling her for a while with her new husband, Chad Daybell. And when she's asked about the the man with Alex that the detectives talked to earlier in the day, she said, oh, that's just a friend of my brother. Doesn't even claim that that's her new husband, Chad Daybell. So some interesting body cam video before that jury. And also this jury learning a little bit more about Tammy Daybell in the uh, hours really before she passed away some text messages between her and her then husband Chad Daybell uh, on September uh, 9th 2019 Chad sends a text to Tammy now his texts usually are very short back and forth with his wife Tammy but on this day it really stood out to this FBI intelligence and analyst a, a longer text message and it said well I've had an interesting morning I felt I should burn all the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms and the reason that this stood out to this uh, analyst is because he knows what happened around September 8th and September 9th that's the last time Tylee Ryan was seen alive at Yellowstone National Park. She's, according to prosecutors, was murdered in the middle of the night and then buried on Chad Daybell's property that next day. And here you have Chad Daybell talking about burning limbs, being in the backyard, maybe a possible cover-up. So a lot before this jury this afternoon, Michael Nashley. This case, I mean, it just kind of goes from bad to worse. The more details we heard, but Speaking of details, we know that David Warwick testimony was really a highlight so far today. Tell us what stood out to you about what he had to say on the stand. Yeah, he was an anticipated witness because he was there, one of the last people to see J.J. Vallow alive in September 2019, and he testified in Chad Daybell's preliminary hearing. Here is the sketch of him in court today. He almost did not get to testify because he violated the, the judge's exclusionary rule by listening to about 45 minutes of his wife Melanie's testimony when she testif uh, testified last week. Uh, he freely admitted it, and the judge allowed his testimony because it didn't taint or you know harm what he had to say. He didn't learn anything new. Uh, but uh, on the stand, he talks about meeting Lori. He talks about meeting Chad that weekend in September where he was in Rexburg to record a podcast with Melanie and Lori. And he observed Lori and Chad together. Chad's still married to his wife, Tammy, at the time. And they were very affectionate. Or he was very affectionate with Lori, so much so that David Warwick asked about Tammy to Chad. And this was Chad's response about his wife, Tammy. He said, well, he had no complaints that Tammy's time was coming up and that he and Lori were going to do the things that they committed to do for God. He had a dream that Tammy was going to pass away before she was 50 
and this struck a chord that he remembered with David. So he um, he thought it was it was odd at the time, but really his testimony about JJ's last sighting with Alex Cox is something that really resonated with jurors. They were taking a lot of notes when he described seeing JJ on his uncle's shoulder, uh, being put to bed, and then the next morning he goes and asks about JJ, where is he? He's not at the home with Lori anymore, and he describes what Lori told him, and we have that answer from the preliminary hearing. Let's watch. I stayed there last night, and this morning Charles showed up, and I don't know what started it. And Charles is your brother-in-law, he and Lori are married? Yes. Okay. So he showed up, um, he was um, following her and yelling, um, and then I got between them. And then Kylie came out with her bat, and they had, I had separated them for a minute, and then my sister had walked around me there in the living room. And then Charles was following Lori and yelling, and Tylee told her to get, told him to get back. She took her bat like that and shoved him, and he took the bat away. And I said, what are you doing? And I got between them, and then he hit me. And I just went down, and when I got up, he was still yelling. And uh, so I went into the bedroom where I was staying, grabbed my gun, and came back. Okay. And uh, told him to put the gun down, or the bat down. And he came to me. And was saying, you're going to, what are you going to do? Like that, come to me with the bat. I said, put it down. He wouldn't. He came at me, so. They're out of the room. So yeah. it's just you and him. Yes. And he basically comes at you with the bat. Yeah. You tell him to put it down. Yes. He's threat. Like, yeah. um, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. And what'd you tell him? I didn't say anything. He's coming to me and I'm, I'm holding the gun. Okay. Uh, if, if you're going to attack someone with the gun, you got to be ready for the repercussions. Did you talk to Lori about JJ that morning? I did. Did uh, What did she tell you about JJ that morning? She said that he was uh, being a zombie and climbed up on the cabinets, climbed up on top of the fridge, smashed her picture of Christ down, and then climbed up onto the upper cabinets and got between the top of the cabinet and the ceiling. Okay. Um, and then what did she tell you? I asked to see him and she just said that he was out of control, so she had Alex come and get him. And who was Alex? Lori's brother. Okay. Is that Alex Cox? Yes. So obviously the first soundbite that rolled was Alex Cox in his police interview, Michael and Ashley, but uh, the second one with David Warwick from the preliminary hearing talking about JJ, according to Lori, being a zombie uh, that morning. So she called Alex to come get him and ultimately pinning again JJ's last sighting with Alex and Lori. Yeah, and you could tell David Warwick knew something was going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? His voice still sounded kind of shaky yeah. on the stand. Uh, Chanley, testimony began this morning uh, with more about Charles Vallow's death. He's been front and center in this trial. What else do we learn today? Right, so the prosecutor's really taking time to let the jury know what happened to Charles Vallow, calling several detectives from the Chandler, Arizona Police Department yesterday and today. This morning, they had an officer, Sergeant Moffitt, who responded to the scene and, and observed Alex Cox at the scene, spoke with him, and also interviewed Alex Cox about what happened. Remember, Alex shot uh, Charles Vallow, saying it was in self-defense. But there were some red flags right there from the beginning with these investigators, even though it took them a couple years to actually charge someone with the murder of Charles Vallow. Uh, but here you see Alex Cox in that interview room describing what happened. Uh, we just heard a soundbite of him saying that, you know, Charles had a bat and hit him in the back of the head and he had to defend himself. Well, on the stand today, Sergeant Nathan Moffitt, again, from the Chandler, Arizona Police Department, told the jury that he, he looked at the back of Alex's head. He observed a small laceration, but it wasn't consistent with being hit extremely hard in the back of the head with a baseball bat by an athletic man, someone who had played uh, baseball Ball. And uh, the part of the story that ended up, but not just that, what Alex told him in the interview room, that he was not there staying at Lori's house to protect her. Lori, in another room, at the same time was telling authorities, yes, my brother was staying with me to protect me from Charles. And also they cite a really bizarre car ride with Alex, Lori, and Tylee in the back seat to and from the police station saying it was just lighthearted, uh, jovial. It was just, well, he said bizarre, Michael and Ashley. 
All right. Well, Chanley Painter, again, thank you so much for that report. Appreciate it as always. Uh, let's bring in our guest for this hour joining us, criminal defense attorney Bob Mata. Um, Bob, here I, I've got to say this. At this point in the trial, it is almost impossible from the testimony we've heard to deny Lori's knowledge about something happening to these kids. From the fact that she talked about them with people about there being zombies, that she told people to lie to her, lie to people about where they were. She told lies about where they were. Um, these conversations uh, regarding where the kids were and Alex took the babies. I mean, sh she can't at this point deny it. Where, where does she go now with this defense? Look, th that's not what they need to prove. You know, I mean, you're talking about obstruction of justice there. They need to prove that she was the puppet master, that she was the one giving direction, that she was the one giving orders, and that either Alex or Chad were, were doing her bidding. So, I mean, look, the state at this point is building its case. And in order to do that, they have to put on the Melanie Gibbs, the Zaluma Pestenis. They have to put these witnesses on so that the jury has an understanding of exactly what was going on with this, you know, offset of the LDS, you know, this kind of cult thing that they had going on. I mean, look, we all know Lori was awful in, in many, many ways. The fact that she hid the fact that her kids were disappeared for months is unconscionable, but they still have to prove the case. So, you know, I mean, at, at this point, they're still working their way through the, through the witnesses. They're still getting the backstory out there. You know, we still need to see some proof that that these people who were in this uh, religious cult, who were indoctrinated, her brother was absolutely indoctrinated. And if if the defense is going to say, look, Alex Cox did this on his own accord because he believed everything that, that Chad and Lori were, were teaching him with respect to how to become one of the exalted, okay, and that, that he did this because he believed what they were saying that both Ty Lee and JJ were, were demons. And, you know, in his mind, it was real. So he went and took care of it on his own. They still have to be able to show that it came from Lori's direction. You know, this case is fascinating. You know, it's, it's horrible in every single way. But from a legal perspective, it's fascinating because of the intersection of religion and the law and the First Amendment and the, you know, the, the right to religious freedom. So, like, we'll see how it plays out. Like, I'm, I'm entranced with this. I wish it was being streamed because it's the only trial in my mind right now. It's, it's unbelievable. But I think there's an intersection of another set of facts because I understand what you said about Lori um, saying out of control, referring to JJ. So he, she had Alex come and get him. But take that in conjunction with the fact we know from opening that her defense is an alibi defense. She says, I was not there um, with JJ and Tylee when they died in the apartment of Alex Cox. I wasn't there. I was somewhere else. So when you take those together, I feel like it helps, Bob. Let me just ask you quickly before we need to take a break. I really think it helps say, yeah, she knew what was going on. Yeah, I, I think that, that there's no question that she knew what was going on. The question is whether or not she, she believed these things, because I want to say this quickly because I know we have to go. When we were looking through the jury instructions proposed by the state, you can't bring insanity in Idaho, but you can challenge the mens rea aspect by bringing in some medical doctor to say, look, Lori believed everything that she was saying, which means that she didn't have the intent even if, like, if she thought her kids were demons, it's going to become an issue, even though they don't have the insanity defense there. So we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, I find it so interesting because I, I want to push back a little, and we do have to take a break on this conspiracy charge, uh, Bob, and we'll discuss it on the other side of the break. But I don't think they have to show she's a ringleader. I think it's enough that she knew that something bad was going to happen to these that kids, and she told lies to people to stop the cops from looking for her or uh, making changes. I think that's enough for a conspiracy conviction. I think I would agree with you, and that's yeah. what I was suggesting, that these things put together suggest she knew what was going on.